We're actually a bit early for the meeting. I just wanted to make sure that we could get everything set up for when everyone oh, joins yes. on. Yes, you. Um, so yeah, the I have kind of the two presentations, but I really would encourage people to, you know, put a hand up and uh, let's try and make it a little bit more of an exchange of ideas. Here it's kind of early in the morning, there it's a bit late. So yes. it, it helps keep everyone awake and engaged, I think. Yeah, I think uh, it is still like uh, 10, 12 minutes to 8 p.m. Pakistan time. And uh, I think that definitely it should be an exchange of ideas between two cultures. So we were yeah. actually talking uh, before that, we have, we have actually logged in by the Pakistan time was supposed to be 7 p.m., but it has changed to 8 p.m. So we are talking with each other for the last one hour now. And we were discussing, so, you know, so I, a lot of things. I, Something I, I, interesting I was, is that uh, out of body, graft <clears throat> out of body time should be reduced. And we were discussing uh, out of body time, graft out of body time. So we yeah. just want to know your, uh, you know, ideas and experience about that. Well, I definitely think it depends a lot on what holding solutions you're using. Um, so I think when I was just using saline or lactated ringers, I was much more concerned about the out of body time. Um, most of the time now, I uh, actually use the hypothermosol with ATP. I use it if I think the out of body time will be anything longer than four or five hours. Uh, ideally, it's less than that. But if I think there's a possibility it will stretch beyond, then I, I use it as a holding solution. What holding solution are you using? Uh, yes, he, most of the people, they, they, uh, the hypothermosol or uh, is not usually available to everyone here. Yeah. Well, they use uh, normal saline water. Uh, what I was talking to them uh, a little while before that, what I do, I do FUT and FUE as well. Uh, what I do in FUT uh, slits uh, 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 First. Uh, before doing uh, step. <laughs> Then up, what I do is uh, after doing slates, I do half of yeah. the step. I don't do the whole yeah. of the step. I give it to the uh, uh, my assistants, and they start making like graphs. I have a big team of like uh, fourteen people to do it, and uh, two of them they come to uh, place the graphs like uh, in the same time. Uh, when uh, when they get finished with this uh, half of this step, then I go for another half yeah. of this step. Then uh, take it out and then give it to them, and they start uh, placing at the same time. So the time of the surgery, uh, reducing the time of surgery, is like amazing thing. And I I am getting uh, like uh, I, I'm not uh, absolutely not uh, concerned about the results because I am having amazing results with this uh, 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 time reduction uh, scenario. Same, what I do in FUE procedure is, uh, I, I make the slits first, and then after making slits, I start XCN of graphs. What I do is, I do only 600, 700 graphs, and then give them back to the, the assistant, they start placing over there. They, they finish with the placing, then I take six, seven hundred graphs again, and then they uh, uh, do placing of. Well, the I definitely, I definitely think if the holding solution is saline, then you have to yes. be really more careful with more, out of body time. Yes, okay. uh, graphs are smaller than they used to be. You know, some of the argument is, well, we used to use saline all the time, and the hair grew. I'm like, yeah, those were punch graphs and slate graphs. They weren't such delicate graphs. So, I, you know, if I didn't have the option of the hypothermosol on ATP, 
I definitely would be doing it in the stage fashion that you're doing. And most of the time I make my sites first, um, but it depends on the case. I yeah. actually yes. use, uh, uh, I don't use saline anymore. I use ringer lactate or yeah. osmolite, you know. They are far we more closer to the pH of, you know, our body. So yeah, I lactated using, ringers is a good option. Yeah, I've stopped using saline. And uh, plus, uh, in strip surgery, actually, if we harvest a strip, Anyway, the time of graft out of body is reduced a lot. But in FUE, follicular unit XC, and you know, the grafts outside body time is a lot, you know, doing uh, extraction and then putting them back in again. So for that, you know, what I have started doing is the, the solution. I, I, I now have this, I have shifted to, you know, PPP, platelet poor plasma. That is, you know, far closer to any of the storage fluids in the world now. I use that. I store my graphs in PPP. And then what I do is that extraction as well as implantation all goes simultaneously at the same time. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm gonna, I just was trying to load up the first talk, but I think this is gonna be the first talk as opposed yes. to the other one, because yes. uh, the adjuvant therapies is gonna get you all really excited. So <laughs> uh, yes. then we won't ever get to the second talk if I start with that one. Uh, so Hello, let's see, what, what time are we at here? We have another think, few minutes. I think so we, will, we will wait for uh, six, seven minutes before. Yeah. I just thought I would get it YouTube, up there. They are also like uh, waiting for... Uh, uh, hi, Devroy. Thank you very much for coming here. Devroy, be here. Thank you very much, Devroy. Thank you, Devroy, for joining in. Hello, Irfan Saab. Hello, how are you? I'm good, fine. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm good. Thank you very this much. This is Dr. Essen. Essen, welcome to the forum. Thank you, thank you. Welcome. Hi, Anger. Hey, Jean. Happy yeah. birthday. <laughs> Jean, I, it was your birthday, wasn't it? I don't know that he can hear me. Yes, might be. Yeah. Right. I was talking about uh, FUD and uh, FUE a uh, uh, little time before, but I was telling my friends that FUT is as important as uh, FUE procedure. But the thing is, uh, when we are, we, we are looking into the uh, patients coming to us, like at the age of 25, 26, 27, or uh, uh, 35, 34, uh, like with the uh, grade uh, five, six boldness, uh, we should be looking for only one thing, how, uh, much uh, boldness will be going like in next 10 years or 15 years and uh, how many graphs we can like take out from only one single procedure of fu this is this this makes like uh, thoughts positive uh, about the uh, fut using fut or a step surgery but we my idea in doing fut procedure is in early ages like at in 30s or in like late 20s is that one thing very important we are taking all the grafts from most permanent donor area and that is central most area on back of the head as uh, 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 Anger says like book a textbook our textbook says like the thing is uh, in FUE procedure uh, whoever doing FUE procedure he will be going like slightly up in the semi-permanent zone or like he will, he can be going like uh, uh, in uh, lower side in the semi-permanent zone, per, uh, permanent zone. 
because he uh, he might not be thinking about the future of that boarding area where where it goes like it goes down to the uh, hill like on uh, back of the head or it is uh, uh, you you can like see retro version of this uh, boarders so uh, one point is this another point is that we are using both procedures like fut and fue we will be taking some graft some amount of grafts in fut procedure and some amount in fue procedure we will be having some good quantity of grafts at the end of day to give some illusions like uh, uh, dr rabin will be talking about illusions so we will be giving some good illusions at the end of day to that big bald areas uh, like this this was my point dr mugis i was uh, 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 giving the answer to your question at that time but uh, uh, now we are having like uh, expert in us and she will be telling us everything about what is going on with fut and fue um i would just ask that everyone make note of whether they have their uh voice muted or not and you know unmute if you need to say something you want to say something but otherwise keep it muted or there's a lot of background noise Well, Rana, you're actually leading it, so you can keep yours on <laughs> until we get to this the start. I, I was actually obeying your orders first. Uh -huh, so I saw. First it. I was just, on myself. I was hearing somebody talking in the background in someone's yes. Uh, yes. voice. Yes. Yeah. I think we are left with two minutes only. Yeah, there's just two minutes. Well, here it's very, very snowy. Let me see, actually. Let me see if I can show you guys how snowy it is. Let me exit this. Wait. Uh, hmm. I welcome Dr. Humayu Momen. He is uh, one of the senior most faculties of hair transplantation of Pakistan. Of you know pakistan a very serious colleague welcome dr humayun thank you thank you mukhis thank you very much hi sir yeah. how are you Where, where's that snow, Robin? I bet it's not more than than what we have here in Pennsylvania. Oh, I'm about to show you it. <laughs> this, uh, get we ready. Over, this over is the picture. Oh, this yeah. is the picture I took this morning. Wow! wow. Looks wow, beautiful. amazing. What do you think? That's up at our farm. Yeah. <laughs> where where are you at? Which which where, where are you located at? Uh, at our farm, which is in Pauling, it's an hour and a half north of New York City. Uh, New York City, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's how gorgeous it looks there. But uh, yeah, it's 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 nice to play in. I can say that. Yes. Uh, not so nice to drive in. <laughs> not not so nice to shovel like I did yesterday. Oh really? Well, drive yes. <laughs> Where are you? Pennsylvania at the moment. Ah. Okay. It's cold there too and you It probably is. got the same north No actually. But it's nice. Oradan seritmelikler şehrini. But you see what's growing in my background? That's a passion fruit. <laughs> I have lemons growing. I have passion fruit. I have everything. We just turn our house into a green, into green a tropical house. or Mediterranean, huh? Yeah. Um, it says sharing is pause. Bring your shared window to the front. Are you guys seeing the presentation? If I start? Yes. 
Please. Okay. Okay. So you guys want to start? Yes. Yes, please. Okay, let's start then. Um, so really, I do encourage everyone to, to pick up if they have something to contribute, because I always think it's better we all learn more if uh, if we exchange ideas more than just lecture to one another, you know, present to one another. So I'm going to talk about the art of the illusion of density, um, which is one of my very favorite topics, um, mostly because virtually every one of our patients, their main issue is going to be that they just don't have enough hair to cover the eventually bald area they will have long term. Um, and we have to learn what tricks we can use to maximize harvesting, but also when we're putting it in, how do we make it look thicker than it really is? Because truthfully, the only thing that gives you true density will be a flap. And we know what a disaster the flaps are. So unless you have a patient that's over the age of 50, all they have is a little frontotemporal recession. Okay, then fine, throw your 2,500 grafts into a two centimeter zone and you'll give them this beautiful thick hairline and it's okay. For the rest of our patients, we have to use tricks. Well, I, I so. think we are unable to see your you know, screen. It is just mm -hmm. the snowy trees which we can see. Oh, no. Okay, hold on. Bring your shared window to the front. You still can't see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see how I can change that then. I'm glad you said something. Resume share here. Now. Oh, the, uh, the trees are beautiful though. And <laughs> uh, so let's see. I don't know why it's not doing it. You see, this is why I wanted to, ah, uh, here we go. New share. Uh, there we go. And mm, there. Let's see. Okay. No, I don't see it. Do you see it now? No. No, no. Okay, sorry. Um, resume share. It says new share. Let me just do it again. And and maybe, sorry, I'll try and stop the share and then start it again. Yes, yes. Sometimes that's how we we get very sophisticated. We reset. Okay. Here Can you, you see it now? Great, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. There, I did it. I'm really not technologically savvy. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, as I was saying, it's really our main limiting factor is how many graphs we have available. And I think I've shown this slide. Um, this is just based on an average uh, number of graphs that some experts in our field that collectively have a lot of experience, a lot of years of experience. Um, this is the estimate they came up with. And you can see no matter what, the range is from as low as 2,000, some people say 1,000, that's obviously, I think, an exaggeration, as low as 2,000 and as high as 12,000. Um, I think probably it's pretty fair to say that in somebody with good density, we can get probably with a combined FUT, FUE approach, we can probably get about seven, eight, 9,000 in most patients with decent density, but that's it. So if you're using 3,000 graphs in a limited area of their scalp, you're leaving them with very little. Um, this is you know, one of our favorite slides. Um, the center area, of course, is where we take the strip from. And the areas uh, surrounding that are where we've actually been able to expand our donor area they are less safe areas, but still, uh, if you choose the stronger, more terminal looking hairs, the ones that 
you know, have three or four units in a bundle or two or three units in a bundle, you're probably going to get those graphs to last over time. Um, so I wanted to just say one word about this. Specifically, this is not a talk about harvest methods. But I really do, I call it the unified uh, elliptical harvest or um, the strip harvest or FUT, whatever you want to call it. I really do think that it will give us the most permanent hairs and the largest number of the most permanent hairs over a patient's lifetime. But FUE has added a new and, 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 uh, extra benefit that, you know, if someone has these big bushy temples here, well, with the strip, we were kind of restricted to this little area in the middle. And if they wanted to wear their hair short, you still couldn't do it. Um, so uh, the fact that we can take FUE from these areas on men that have bushy temples, it actually helps with the illusion of density. Because the bushier these are, the thinner this will look by comparison. So if we can use FUE to kind of thin out these areas and use that hair, replace it up here, then we've actually made the illusion of density greater. We've actually achieved two things. We've thinned this area, which makes this look thicker, and we've gotten more graphs. So I do think it's good to try and um, learn to do both and ideally offer both to your patients. Other areas of potential graphs are also opened up by FUE. I personally don't have a lot of experience, nor do I have a lot of faith in body hair transplantation from areas uh, much outside the beard. Um, and I know it may also be somewhat ethnically uh, based, like maybe there are people that have much stronger chest hair than Caucasians in New York. Um, but it's been my experience that patients that have come to me from other doctors and had that done, that there wasn't a great survival. What do you guys find in terms of chest hair, back hair, leg hair from your patients? I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to share my experience, Robin. Yeah. I did it uh, in many patients from chin and chest. And I found best hair were chin and second yeah. line of their uh, diameter and their growth rate was, second one was chest, but first one, my was chin. Yeah, so it's a beard area. Yes. I think, yeah. yeah, I think that's consistently across the board. Uh, people will say the beard area will be the best sort of body hair to take. Um, but yeah, I guess chest hair, it depends on the calendar, maybe. Um, okay, so uh, let's go on. I'm going to start with uh, some of the tricks I use uh, to maximize the illusion of density. The first trick, it's um, actually very convenient. It's that I make the hairline less dense. Um, so the more dense you make the hairline, the more dense you have to create behind the hairline to make the patient's hair look really full. Is somebody, sorry, Yawar, Yawar, are you speaking? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, you know, the, the, the thing that I think a lot of uh, hair transplant surgeons early on don't understand is that the hairline should always look less dense than whatever's behind it. So the more dense you make your hairline, the more dense you have to make everything behind it, which means you can't really cover much of the bald area. So I usually do a very feathered, not very dense hairline, and except in the corners, so if you hear that illusion falls apart, um, you actually do need to create slightly higher um, density in those areas. In the central forelock, that area I usually make coronal incisions. 
Um, I don't make coronal incisions everywhere uh, because I find that when I make them just uh, parallel to the angle and direction of the hair, that that looks the most natural. But in this region, really what I want to do is block the light. So if I have the grass facing like this, instead of facing like this, they block more light. Um, I weight the density usually more on the part side and the regions where the hair fans out. And in women, I still use DFUs, um, sometimes even in men. Uh, but because I do uh, follicular unit excision by two methods, uh, I do it both by the strip and by FUE, I have the option of different size graphs. Now I'm gonna start with this because this is the most common thing that I see that's you know, obviously the most common mistake that I see, which is again, that low hairline, most of the grass placed there. Obviously it wasn't a very large procedure, but it's exactly what shouldn't be done. The patient came in, there were frontotemporal recessions and all the surgeon did was fill that. And now the patient is left with a canvas he can't fill because he already has really low density on the donor and the, um, the temporal areas of his head. So what would you guys advise? I'd like to hear from you. What would you advise this patient to do? They come to you. Morris, you're, you're muted. Yes. First of all, I would like to take his uh, hairline correction bit uh, should be above the, it's now it's placed. I mean to say is I will extract by a few e few graphs to make temporal, uh, frontotemporal angles properly. This, these angles are obliterated and it has given its unnatural look. So I will uh, take few graphs from here. Uh, then I will place these graphs on the area where it is needed. So basically, I would like to uh, the uh, the bluntness of this temporal frontotemporal angle correction of this. Then it will make a bit more acceptable. Okay, so I I agree with you, but one of the tricks I learned, and this is why I asked you, is okay. So there's an instinct because they did this so flat here. There's an instinct to say, we got to take out all of that, right? But actually, there's a trick that I learned, which is, and it makes the patients way happier. So you know how there's this temporal hump here on this area? So these graphs here can actually become part of a temporal hump. And all you actually need to do is remove this little wedge. And then, oh, I just clicked too hard. So when you remove this little wedge, you remove it with FUE or laser, it's really only about 30 or 35 hairs there. You've left the patient, yes, they will now have a receded look, but their hairline is shorter than it would be otherwise, and therefore it doesn't feel so receded to the patient. So, um, that's just one of the tricks I wanted to start out with because I actually have um, this photo kind of shows hardly that. So this is a relatively young man who came to me and has really a large area of thinning. And he doesn't have money for a lot of surgeries and he wanted to kind of cover as much of it as he could in one surgery. Um, he had decent density, but not great. And this is what we were able to achieve. It was not a huge session, not a small session, 2279. And what you can see, there's a few tricks I used here. So one is the one I just talked about. So look at how long this line actually is. When you bring these edges here forward like that, you shorten their hairline to just this. So if you look here, you can see he has it looks like I lowered his hairline a lot, but I didn't. I just brought in these edges a little bit and, and, and I filled it in, obviously. 
So that's one of the tricks that I use. You have to make sure you angle the graphs that are in the temporal hump nice and flat to the head. You don't need to do really high density in those areas because they are so acutely angled. Another trick I use is I watch how the hair curls. So this is his curl. If I make it denser here than I do over here, I actually create a greater illusion of density because wherever the fan starts is where you have to make it more dense. Again, you can see that his hairline, I made less dense than what's behind it. So those are some of the tricks that I used in this um, patient. I will add that I do recommend certain things for my patients in how they wear their hair. So if somebody says to me, really what I wanna be able to do is just buzz cut my hair and I don't wanna to have to stick to any style whatsoever and wear it, well then there is no illusion of density. Then you just have to plan your thing out so that it looks relatively even everywhere. But that's not an option for every patient. We don't have enough donor for that for every patient. So I do make certain recommendations on hairstyling as well. And in that patient, I said, it's best if you leave it medium length because then you get to take advantage of the curl. As I said, I shortened the hairline by bringing the lateral humps forward. I feathered the hairline and therefore what's there looks denser than it really is. So I'm gonna go through, hmm, I don't know why that one's overlapped. Oh, that's not great, but um, yeah, that moved. I don't know if I can move it back right now because it's in presentation mode. Okay, well, I won't be able to show you the after because it's actually the before is sitting on top of it, but this patient has pretty low density and he had a transplant done already. He had a scar already. And what I was trying to do was create the illusion of density for somebody who doesn't have a lot of donor left. And what we discussed is building up this temporal hump, his hair parts from that region. Obviously the hairs that were given to him were put at an angle that was a little bit too perpendicular. So we wanted to flatten that down a little bit and essentially give him more weight on this side than the other side and more weight in the center. And that's what I did. You're not gonna be able to see the after because uh, something happened to that. So. Now I'm gonna show you some more examples. These ones are patients that I would say have average density at young ages, large areas of balding. So, you know, you wanna do a decent size session with them, 23, 24, 25, 2600 uh, follicular units is usually where the range I'm in. And, uh, um, you want adjuvant therapy. So this is a patient who didn't use adjuvant therapy. He, uh, he didn't want to deal with minoxidil. He didn't want to take any pills. He didn't come back to see me for any of the other regenerative therapies. So we did achieve a nice result on him, but you can see that he's continued to thin in this area, in this area, which we didn't treat. And that is actually obviously not ideal for creating the look of density. If he'd been able to hold on to more of that area in the back, um, then he would look as good from this position as he does in this position. Um, this patient here um, is not one of my favorites, and that's why I'm showing it to you. Um, hopefully, it's clear to you uh, because there was just this weird angle here that ended up with his hair going off to the side very significantly, but also a little more perpendicular than I like. So I'm using this as an example to say, I'm not, ex I'm not actually still certain what happened with this patient. I think it's actually the natural angle of his hair was like that. And therefore, he ended up not getting as good an illusion of density as I otherwise would have gotten. You know, I do follow, some people say, well, if there's hardly any native hair there, you don't need to follow the angle and direction of the native hair. I guess it was just drummed into me. You always follow the angle and direction of the native hair. 
And if that native hair happens to be this hair that's, you know, a little more upward or has a cowlick right in the wrong spot, then you lose the illusion of density. So that's kind of what I wanted to show in this slide. Um, I just wanted to give you one slide that shows a close-up of sites. Um, it looks a little blurry in my screen. Hopefully it's not in yours. Um, because I wanted you to see how dense I make my sites. It's not that dense. It's really not. I would say the majority of my cases are about 30 follicular units per square centimeter. Sometimes it's a little higher depending on the caliber of the hair. Um, one weird ironic twist I realized, and probably in your practices you see this a lot more, is if the hair is really coarse, I do find the hairline has to be done with higher density of only single hair grafts. And um, it does turn out a little more dense than my hairlines in people with fine hair. Um, because fine hair, you can space it out more and it looks, you don't see the spaces as much. The coarser the hair is, the more the space kind of stands out. Do you guys find that? Rana, do you find that you have to use um, more density in the front hairline and coarse haired people? Actually, uh, no, I, I, I never used uh, higher densities in the frontal line. Actually, uh, I, I usually concentrate on the, what I do is like uh, I make some flares uh, from combing side to the other side. And uh, uh, I keep the angle like tilted towards the other side so that if he can comb on the, uh, uh, he is combing, he, he could be having some a good illusion of density in the whole area. But, uh, uh, and other thing is what I concentrate on, uh, uh, that is uh, a frontal tuft. And uh, that, yeah. that is that is little much, a uh, little uh, bit more denser than the hairline. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I put uh, less graphs on the uh, opposite to the combing side. Yeah. So, so that uh, uh, because we are having a wide uh, bald area and less number of graphs. So th this could be the arrangement to give some illusion of density in any case. But this yeah. is my opinion. Yeah, I agree. So this is um, just, I wanted to at least discuss briefly where the, uh, the, I showed you already one uh, example of where the illusion of density kind of falls apart and the vertex is the other area where the illusion of density is not so um, readily uh, utilized and that's because the hair spins out in opposing directions. But what I have found is if you concentrate a little more density, again, like at the base of the fan, where it fans out. So you concentrate a little more density here. And the other thing I do is I tend to use three haired grafts in this region here, um, because there the hair is sitting forward and flat. Um, it's kind of like the frontal tuft region of the crown. And when you look at that up close, you, it, it takes on the look of higher density, even if um, actually the higher density of sites was here. So when you, when you do a crown in that manner, what you actually achieve is, yes, you can still see scalp. I always tell my patients, you're still going to be able to see scalp. Um, it's only in teenagers you can't see scalp. But um, it kind of looks like a natural thinning pattern, right? Where it's a little bit thinner in this area and then thicker in these areas. And because these areas are actually larger, it makes it a little more difficult to make them look denser if you don't use um, follicular units that have more graphs in them. Um, this is... So I'm gonna show just two other, I think there's just a few other slides, but this is actually a very um, typical patient in my practice who comes to me with still a lot of existing hair. 
and just never wants to go through the awkward phase of being bald and then getting the hair back. And in those patients, usually what I do, uh, you can see that the hairline, I think you can see that the hairline here is moved forward just a little bit. If you look at where his wrinkle is there and where it is here. So I moved it forward a little bit, but I kept the exact same contour. I didn't make it flat or I didn't make it more receded. I kept the same contour. I just moved it forward a little. And basically all the density went where he had existing hair. Um, so that's, I would say that's another one of the tricks we use where we um, keep the contour the same. And I think then, you know, no, it's not this patient. Wait, let me go forward a minute. It's there's this patient. Uh, I don't know, it chopped that off in some weird way, but hopefully you can make it out. Can you see these photos fairly well? It looks like it shortened them. Um, Basically, what I did with this patient is I kept this contour, his, his front contour, almost exactly the same and moved everything forward so that when you saw him from the front, he was framed when he's on a zoom. He has this frame to his face. It doesn't kind of fall off more. These, these deeper temples I did bring forward, but I brought the whole thing forward by the same amount. So then you look here and he's lower in the front here than he was originally. The temples are filled in a little more, but I kept the same contour. Temples are filled in. Let me just go back. Um, okay. Is everyone hearing me okay? Hearing me okay? Okay. There's a slight delay on my end. Yes, so. we can hear you. Okay. So I've shown this picture a number of times. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures because I really didn't even know whether I could make this woman happy enough that she wouldn't have to wear a hairpiece of some sort, which is the stage she was at when I met her. And we didn't use that many graphs. We really, what I did is I concentrated it in the area where her hair parts from. So you look at the way she has this natural curl and cowlick that comes out here. And we concentrated the grafts in the frontal tuft and that region. And what that did was it gave her styling options that it would fall over the remaining areas. And obviously, I mean, compared to this, her hair is a little more styled in this uh, second photo. But you can see that she doesn't need to use a wig. She just needs to work with the hair a little bit. And that's a perfect example of the illusion of density. That's not a lot of graphs. It's just choosing where to place them and what density to place them at very, very carefully. Um, this is another woman that was in a fairly similar situation, uh, younger age, but really, really thin. And these are her before photos. She, she wore her hair a lighter color before so that there was less contrast with the scalp. Um, and then she went to wearing it a darker color. So I can't change the fact that she changed her hair color. In fact, of course, um, the fact she changed her hair color only emphasizes how much better this part line got, for example. So in women, doing the part line and the frontal tuft are key. Um, too many people, I think, are just doing the front line in women. And sometimes that is the most important. If the women always want to wear their hair back, then that may be more important. But I usually think this area is more important. This is a perfect example of when the illusion of density wasn't used and in the same patient with the same hair type when the illusion of density was used. Um, this patient had a transplant done by somebody else, um, kind of an even distribution of hair placed over the bald area and everything set perpendicular. And this is you know, what he looked like, he wasn't very happy. And I said, well, I can't 
I, I can't do much about these hairs here that are already there and, and perpendicularly oriented, but I can try and flatten them with enough density. So you can still make out that, that slightly irregular um, perpendicular direction, but there's enough that I put here that it kind of weighed it down. Um, okay, so then my final slide of this, uh, this uh, talk, um, this is what I like to make sure everyone remembers, that we actually have a lot of different tools, many more than we used to have um, at our disposal to create these illusions of density. Um, there's multiple harvest methods, there are single follicular unit graphs, multi-follicular unit graphs. Um, and of course, the orientation of the graphs has always been important, but we definitely learned some more tricks. Even the coronal incisions, you know, when that concept initially came up, I don't, I don't speak of coronal incisions as perpendicular or parallel. Coronal to me means coronal. It's the anatomic sense and really using the coronal incisions in this mid scalp and uh, frontal tuft area does definitely block more light from going through. So that concept wasn't there when I started. Um, so that's been a new one. Um, and of course we have other, other new uh, modalities that I'm gonna talk about in the next talk. And they're also very useful in helping us create the illusion of density. All right. So does anybody want to um, talk to me about anything that we just talked about in that uh, presentation? I'd like to hear from you if you have any additional tips that I didn't uh, touch on that you think, oh, this is one of my tricks I'd like to share. Aziz? Do you want to ask something? I, I would like to have my trick of uh, density in a hairline. Uh, for initial few uh, 5, 0.5 to 1 centimeter, that is a transition zone, I always keep it less dense. And behind that, I concentrate on that dense zone. I always try to keep it up to 40 to 45 graphs per square centimeter in that one centimeter. That gives you the block of your light and not concentrating. Most of the people make a mistake. They make a dense line rather than um, making a transition zone. So transition zone is a very important uh, uh, 0.5 to 1 centimeter. After that, if you concentrate 40 to 45 graphs per square centimeter of uh, that zone, then it will definitely block the light and give a denser appearance. So you're suggesting that the hairline be made more dense? Or, no. or the behind the hairline? Yes. Yeah. In okay. Here, yes. 0.5 to 1 centimeter, that transition zone should not be dense. But after that 1 centimeter dense zone, it will definitely block the light. And behind that, you can distribute according to the availability versus availability of graft versus your uh, recipient area. Mm. Yes, but, but um, I, I like, I like uh, your idea of uh, doing graphs on uh, like uh, tricky graphs on uh, uh, vertex area, crown area. That was uh, uh, brilliant to me. I was looking for and hopefully I will be <laughs> Uh, starting those things uh, from tomorrow in my clinic. I was, uh, uh, I'm very much impressed by that. So, uh, by putting like uh, three graphs in, uh, like in frontal direction, and it will give like uh, a big density. And uh, when you did some graphs like in the same direction in the lower, at the lower edge of the crown, and uh, that can augment the upper uh, density and uh, it can create a very good illusion. That was amazing thing, uh, that was amazing um, thing. I can say one thing, uh, Dr. Saifi, by the way. Uh, Robin, um, I'm sorry, can you hear me? 
Yeah. Yes, we can hear yeah. you. I just uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong because you mentioned something about the crown area using uh, grass with two with two hairs, three hairs. I recall, I remember uh, last uh, lecture by Dr. Um, Muhammad. Uh, uh, I was impressed with the way he did it. He explained it um, that he uses a single graft in the area where we have more skin and uh, uh, like in the center of the, of the crown and um, it looks more natural. Well, yeah, so maybe you didn't understand. The center of the crown, I use only one in two hair grafts, depending on the texture of the patient's hair. So okay, if I they have very it. fine yeah. hair, I can use a two hair graft. Otherwise, yes, mostly one hair graft. Okay. Um, but in the anterior aspect of the vertex, Mm. kind of the posterior mid-scalp anterior vertex. That's the area I do find using three hair grafts creates more of an illusion of density. Totally agree. Thanks a lot. Sure. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, I, I Robert, want to add some, something to this uh, before we take Dr. Hamayu as well. He is here. Uh, the thing is, uh, when Dr. Hamayu was explaining to the uh, uh, posterior uh, uh, hairline, like uh, occipital hairline. He was say, he was uh, like telling us about uh, when the vertex is bald and we are ending up with the uh, vertex is still bald, and we, ah, we are ending yeah. up somewhere else uh, uh, before vertex. Then we can we are uh, it, it it looks some awkward with when we are putting some multiple unit graphs. At, at that point, we can use like single follicular unit graph yes. to give so, it natural look on the so back of I the will say, I will say that when I know I'm not going to transplant the vertex or I'm not sure if in a future surgery I will, the posterior aspect of my frontal two-thirds is done with a posterior hairline. So oh, yes. the same kind of thing I use in the front with single hairs and feathering is what I use in the back. Yes, that, that was the actual about, point, actually. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Dr. Um, Mayu, um, if you are what, there, can you explain yes. your idea? Okay. Um, um, Robin, it's a wonderful thing, and I'm really happy that somebody else is, a, you know, thinking like me. Um, um, when I say the posterior hairline, the lost frontier, we published a paper. It was exactly what uh, it was. It was if you are not doing the crown. But having said that thing, I went further to that, that any place, even if you are doing the crown, the central part of the crown, which as you mentioned rightly, you will always see the skin. Now that part of the crown will always have single hair to make it look like a natural thinning process and not have um, threes and twos and threes or multiple follicular units sort of things. So I will still have the, the, the single graphs which are visible. Now, the second point. I generally, when I'm doing the bigger surgeries or type six and seven, I always split them in two surgeries, no matter what. Even if I can take 6,000 graft in one session, yeah. I'll split it in two sessions, which is 4,000 or 3,500 in one session and 2,000 or 2,500 in second. The reason being is my second surgery, I asked the patient to come with the style he wants to uh, you know, adopt. And that is where now I will do a strategic placing. That means I will, you know, it's about light and shades. You don't, you want to put your graft in such a way that the light do not travel to the skin and only you can see the shade of the hair. So in that way, you can create illusion with much lesser number of graphs. And as opposed to um, Vares, who just mentioned, I have never ever used more than 2,500, 25 to 30 graphs per square centimeter. Even in my densest packing, I do not cross 30 because I personally believe if God has given you 50% of the cushion, why do you want to touch that 50% of the cushion? 
you are already doing something so go down that so if you touch 25 to 30 grams per square centimeter which is on an average of 2 your 1.9 here per per gram you will give an illusion of about 40 percent density of the true density so in that way you can create more illusions and if you go to um, Koran, um, uh, that paper uh, where he mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the minimum coverage uh, area or minimum coverage density or uh, factor, which is six, same thing can be applied towards uh, recipient area, but now you add the length of the hair, which is uh, hair uh, mass index. And this is what John Cole has also mentioned. So if you use that thing uh, scientifically and a little bit more artistically, you can actually get away with a very less number of graphs and very good illusion of density. I agree. All right. So um, I think I should move on to the next talk. Um, and now, and then uh, we'll... I, I want to say something. Sure. Like, uh, if, if we can, uh, uh, some of us can put videos on Dr. Mugis. Are you there? Dr. Mugis, are you there? Yes, I am here. Uh, can you can you put on your video you video please? Well actually uh, we we actually uh, uh, HRSP has planned some uh, standing ovation to uh, uh, Dr. Robin Unger and I would request all of you, please stand up for a one second for it, for ourselves. Uh, for uh, you don't need to stand to, up. To, you guys are comfortable to stand uh, <laughs> Services to the field of hair restoration. Please, thank you very much. We are standing up. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, it's much easier to come to a meeting of the Pakistani Hair Restoration Society without having to travel to Pakistan. <laughs> Thank you very much. You have to I'm travel to Pakistan to next year. We are planning uh, our annual meeting and uh, we love to have you in Pakistan. It's an amazing country. Yes, I know I've heard. Um, I have no idea what travel plans are going to look like. I've been putting off trips now for I don't know how long. We, but none of us know this one, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the adjuvant therapies. Um, and part of the reason why I tacked this on is um, initially I was just going to talk about ways to artistically use the limited graphs we have. Um, and then I realized actually... It really integral to my practice has become ways to try and reverse miniaturization and hold on to as much hair as we start with, because that's actually the best way to keep a patient looking denser for longer. Um, so um, that's why I added this one on. Um, I will say that when I started in practice with my dad, which is now more than 20 years ago, about 25 years ago, um, you know, he always said, well, they've already tried the, the medical therapy. It hasn't worked. That's why they're coming to see me. And in many cases that was true, but in some cases it wasn't true. And my dad was like, well, they're the medical people and we're the surgical people. And what, what of course we've learned over time is that line is not so um, hard and fast. And it's really important that we spend the time to go through the details of how we can hold on to the hair um, before we start going moving it around. Um, so some of the medical therapies have already been discussed and then actually my talk was kind of planned and then other talks got planned and so some of this may be repetitive. If it is, I apologize. Um, I'm going to touch on minoxidil, the oral and topical, the DHT blockers, PRP and exosomes. Um, obviously another adjuvant therapy, I call it an adjuvant therapy is the SMP because that definitely does help with the illusion of density. I just, I'm a little worried that people are using it willy nilly. Um, so they over harvest or under treat or treat in an unnatural distribution. 
and then use SMP to kind of cover up the mistakes. But if the patient stops doing the SMP at some point, um, everything's going to show. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. So minoxidil, we all know well. Um, it's effective in 60 to 70% of men and women. And what I really want to go through is kind of how do I approach these things with my patients? So we have this grab bag of potential um, treatments to slow miniaturization or reverse the miniaturization. And I have kind of a, a, a way I go through it with patients and that's what I'm going to go through with you guys. Um, so you get an idea of the way I think about it and we can discuss why somebody else might think differently or if you have another suggestion you think is important to consider, then speak up. Um, so the minoxidil is usually my first line. A patient comes to me, they've never been treated before. This one, cheap, effective and you know, clinical studies that are really well proven effectiveness, um, almost no side effects. And um, it's, it's a pretty easy sell for your patients. The main downside to the minoxidil has been the fact you have to put it on your head every day. So that means you're reminding yourself every day of where your hair loss has occurred. It, it's psychologically, the topical application is a little tough, especially for the twice a day application, which is for men. But for women, it's also tough because it makes their hair sticky. It makes it a little greasy or oily and they don't like to wash their hair often every day. A lot of them go in and they get it styled so they don't wash it every day. So the topical has been a bit of a hard sell on that point. Also topical irritation is one of the problems. And um, that's why when we got more comfortable with the oral application, it was, oh, great, that works because that's still minoxidil. It still has very few side effects, doesn't interfere with hormones or sexual function. And uh, it's only popping half a pill a day. So that was, my, I would say like my first line would be the topical. And then if they really didn't like the idea of the topical, I would say, okay, let's try the oral. Um, and the main problem with the oral has been the hirsutism or the hypertrichosis in women. Um, I really have not had many of them that had to go off it because of any swelling or irregular heartbeats or any, any other symptoms, maybe a handful in the last five or six years. And I'm going to show you all these photos because I think it's really important to understand. We can get wow photos from every one of these adjuvant therapies. Um, so this is really a wow photo. And this is a patient only six months after starting minoxidil. He used nothing else, changed nothing else, because I usually do one thing at a time. And look at that result. He's, he's the best I've ever seen. But I will say that we can get great results with that. Okay, now let's say the minoxidil doesn't work for them or they've been using it for six, seven years. It's not working so well anymore. Well, then I moved to the DHT blockers. Um, and I will say that um, until very recently, my go-to uh, medication in this category was Propecia, the actual trade name Propecia. And I would start a patient on it for one year at the end of one year, they could switch to the generic finasteride and we would be able to see whether it's working as well as the trade name was working. In my experience, the Propecia worked better than most of the generics. Um, but I changed about maybe three or four years ago. And much of the time now I'm, doing instead of the finasteride one milligram to five milligrams, um, I'm usually doing the dutasteride. And that's 0.5 milligrams. I usually dose it every other day um, initially. And if we need to increase it for any reason, I increase it to daily. Um, why is that one my preferred uh, DHT blocker now? Basically because it has fewer side effects and I think it works better. They both work. 
but I think it works better. And here's an example. Wait. Yeah, I think that's the one. Yeah. So this is a patient on 0.5 milligrams of Dutasteride daily. I, I promise you they started nothing else. It worked in their frontotemporal angles as well. I can't quite explain it, but it did. And it worked in the mid scalp region. This is a photo that Chiara and Salako shared with me. Um, and this is with the topical finasteride. So up until very, very recently, I did not really believe that the topical finasteride uh, could work. Um, I was taught that it has to be processed in the liver. And therefore, if the topical is going to work, it's because it's getting absorbed systemically, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, only one of the active ingredients of the active uh, metabolites of finasteride has to be activated in the liver. Um, the rest of it can be effective just in its original form. So when I started seeing these photos from Chiara, um, I, I started looking for a compounding pharmacy that could make it up for me. I think uh, it's interesting that patients are so afraid of the side effects um, that they would rather not use finasteride than use it orally. So having this other option for them is a really great additional tool in my toolbox. And now we get to my favorite <laughs> topic. Um, this really has been my favorite topic for a long time because I think it's the future of hair restoration. I think, you know, surgery will be needed in cases always, but I really do believe this is, this is where we're going. It's regenerative therapy. And, and I don't know whether it's PRP or exosomes, but it's about trying to reverse the miniaturization early enough that patients actually won't need our surgical skills. Um, and PRP, I've been doing more than 12 years, including on myself, including on my husband, including on other family members. Um, it is tremendously successful in my practice, but it is the most frustrating field of hair restoration to deal with because it's all over the map. Um, what one person calls PRP, I mean, to me is literally just injecting plasma back in the patient's head. It's, it's not platelet rich. It doesn't have a cell in it. They don't micro needle. They don't do, you know, it's, it, it's a sham. Maybe it's micro needling with the injections that's helping in some cases, but basically the protocol I use, I don't make this stuff up for any reason. I don't, advertise numbers or success rates online. I don't even tell the patient when they ask me, uh, what's my percent of success? I said, look, if I tell you my percent of success is 90%, well, you're gonna sign up, right? But if you fall into the 10% that don't respond, well, then you're gonna feel you were duped. You were kind of led to believe it works in almost everyone and, and that's why you did it and now you feel cheated. So I'm not gonna tell you my numbers. I'm gonna tell you it's either gonna work for you or it's not. And I'll be honest with you, I'll be transparent. I'll show you your before photos, we'll compare them with your after photos, put them side by side on a screen together. And that's how we'll decide. And to me, that's the only way to do this. Um, and this is just an example of a set of photos, literally, I took it off the computer um, where we had a patient who did, and, and I always do just the PRP. So I'm not adding PRP and at the same time minoxidil or PRP and at the same time dutasteride. Um, it, this is PRP alone, and you can see what kind of result he got in uh, three months. Um, this is me. See, I told you I'd do it. And you can see my part has gotten much thicker. My frontotemporal angles here also got thicker. Even my hairline um, got thicker. 
I've been doing it for a long time, uh, but I will tell you that I have patients it works incredibly well and patients not so well. This is a new use for the PRP that I didn't always feel so confident in, and this is for alopecia areata that's resistant to traditional treatments. So this woman is a physician, actually. Her mother-in-law is a dermatologist who had been treating her with traditional treatments forever. And every time she would get the hair to grow back with some you know, monthly injections of steroid, and then when she would stop the steroids, it would, it would show up again. And it, would, it was moving around. It was moving around her head spots of Ariada. And this is her after just um, so what I did with her, most of the time I do only one or two PRPs, and then I assess for effectiveness on androgenetic alopecia. But with um, alopecia areata, I'm afraid to do that. I do one a month for three months, and then I stop, and we see what happens. And she grew back all her hair. Uh, within three, four, five months, we saw it was totally filling in and she is now about three years out. So she said she never went more than six months without a new spot showing up on her head. And now she's already been about three years with no new spots. So I do think the PRP kind of almost re, reconfigured her scalp atmosphere or the cells there. Um, this is a gentleman who came to me and said, I don't wanna take pills. I don't want to put lotions or potions on. I want to come in once a year, get your injections. I hear they work. And for him, they did. They don't always work. And then I don't have much else left to offer the patient until recently. And these are the exosomes. So exosomes, um, again, it's like the wild, wild west out there. And that's why the FDA has issued warnings because everyone's calling their thing either stem cells or exosomes. And every time a patient asks me, well, what about adding stem cells? And I'm like, I don't know what those stem cells are you're talking about. What stem cells are you talking about? Are they embryonic, placental, uh, fat derived? What are they? So um, I'm actually about to start the IND um, in the new year um, for one of the exosome companies that, uh, to be totally transparent, I am an investor and not a huge investor, but I, I was enthusiastic enough that I, I put some money in. Anyhow, I'm going to do um, a research with Jerry Shapiro um, for them in the new year, and hopefully we can get some concrete data. Why exosomes? And I'm gonna show you because this woman is our perfect example of why. So this was her before PRP. She tried everything. Minoxidil, dutasteride, she tried everything. She doesn't have enough hair to even transplant. This was her before. This was her one month later. This is her going back to dyeing her hair a dark color that she always wanted, but she couldn't use because she was so thin and four months after one treatment. We're ecstatic, we're so excited. She comes back for <laughs> another treatment in another area and we do another treatment. And in the worst experience I had, this is what ended up happening. Why? We had no idea initially and then we figured out she does have multiple sclerosis. She had it the first time she did PRP too, but she gets an infusion regularly. And the timing between that infusion and the PRP was different this time than another time. And I think that meant that the soup of proteins that was in her PRP was in a disbalance and it actually made her hair loss worse. It made it, it was horrible. I since discovered anybody with a very active autoimmune disease, you don't do PRP on them. Their soup is not in good balance. It will not be successful. And I've had only three patients that actually lost hair after PRP, this woman being one of them. They all had very active autoimmune disorders. So that's why we need exosomes. 
exosomes are basically soup taken from another source. So the same active ingredient, the same kind of soup of cytokines is now being taken from another source. And I always tell patients the important questions to ask are, where are they coming from? Is there animal or hormone media being used in the process? Because that would also affect what's coming into you. How are the donors screened? And of those donors, how many vials are produced from each donor? And what's in the exosomes? How many uh, exosomes per ml of the product and how many cytokines in each ml. Um, I think you guys probably have read about what the exosomes are. Essentially, they're membranous bound vesicles that contain within them cytokines. Um, the company, I got this, it says company, confidential, direct biologics, that's the one I work with. So I have their confidential thing, they said I could show it. But you can see that basically what we're looking at is a, a cytokine soup that optimizes the regenerative potential in an area. But why would, why would those cytokines even go into action? What makes them go into action? Uh, and what I think has to be done in combination with exosomes is microneedling. Just as with PRP, I think microneedling should be done. The whole point is you need to create injury to trick the body into selling, sending cells in to repair the injury. The soup of cytokines is just ammunition those cells are going to use. So if you have fewer cells that are you know, kind of drawn into the area, then you have fewer cells to do the regenerative work, regardless of how many exosomes you inject. Um, usually the guideline as to when I use exosomes versus PRP is when good PRP with a cell has failed, I use exosomes. If a patient has a poorly controlled inflammatory or autoimmune disease, I use exosomes. If there was some sort of immunomodulatory treatment, like for MS, I use exosomes. And I actually, I say maybe less clear, but with age, I actually have started telling patients, we know the regenerative potential of uh, humans uh, goes down after the age of 65 or 70, depending on how good your general health is. Um, so I think the soup that those patients are producing is less than optimal, it's better to use exosomes probably. So I actually just took, I think this series was just the last three patients that came in, I didn't select. I said the next three patients that come in that had exosome therapy, I'm gonna put in the presentation. So this is one, and actually she, came, she just came back in and she's even better, but this is one patient you can see that there's been an increase in volume, but it's not something out of this world. It's only three months. This patient, uh, it's six months. And you can see there's been absolutely a huge improvement. So I'm, I'm seeing the exosomes take a bit longer to see more improvement. And... Um, ah. And this is another patient who I think I presented already at, um, at another conference, but basically she was using PRP and ACEL. She was doing quite well with that, but she wanted to see whether the exosomes would do better. And I said, okay, if you're willing to spend the money, I only charge the cost of the exosomes then we can try it. And these are her pictures. So this was her two months after PRP, ACL, and exosomes combined. Um, her hair is darker in this photo. Her hair in this photo is closer to her before photo. I asked her to make it a little closer um, just to make it clearer. Uh, so this is her picture four months after that combined treatment. So again, you can see those results are very nice. Now, are they better than what a good result with minoxidil would be? No, 
And that's what I tell patients, and that's the honest truth. If you're a responder to minoxidil and you don't mind putting it on your head every day or taking the pill every day, if you fall into the group of the good responders, you're gonna get a good response and you'll be happy with it. If not, well, then you might wanna try something else that you could be a good responder to. Um, oh, this was a patient that just came in yesterday and she was a physician who tried everything already. And um, these are her before and after, again, just four months treatment with exosomes. So you can see that one turned out pretty well too. And that's it. So um, thank you for your attention. And anyone have questions? No, no questions? Please. If you want to ask question directly to like uh, uh, Robin, you can ask her, what is? Uh, you're uh, muted. Un Boris. Unmute yourself, Dr. Varis. Yes. Uh, I do have uh, experience of PRP for last at least eight to 10 years. And I think the most important thing is what I felt is the enough quantity of PRP solution, number one. Number two, uh, if you do micro needling along with PRP, I mean taking multiple bites or multiple pricks to at least three to four mm depth. depth. If you deliver that solution up to the level of hair bulb, then it is more effective. I mean, at least I have four to five PRP patients daily. I'm doing it for last at least eight to 10 years. And I do by centrifuge. I do it centrifuge twice. First at 3000 revolutions for 10 minutes after 15 minutes to 3500 to 4000 revolutions. So by using I take 50 ml, uh, 40 ml of blood and I get 15 to 18 ml of PRP solution. Sorry, say that again. I take 40 ml of blood and I get at least 18, 15 to 18 ml of PRP solution out of it. And I inject it from here to here and with multiple pricks. I mean, additional work is your micro needling. I do it with a lot of pricks and deliver this solution up to 3 mm to 4 mm up to the hair bulb. So it's in my practice, it's very effective. And how many, how many sessions of PRP do you do on a patient to see effective? Three, three to six minimum. On first consultation. So, so I, I will tell you that's that's the most common protocol that I've heard to be an effective kind of alternative protocol to what I'm using. But with mine, I need only one or two treatments. I draw more blood than you. I draw 100 to 120 mLs, and it concentrates down though only to about five to seven mLs. So I have a very highly concentrated uh, PRP mm -hmm. and I combine it with a cell uh, okay. so that I have a scaffold for it to stay in place to work for longer. And I think that's why it's, it's not that the way you're doing it doesn't work. It's a more diluted uh, version of, than my version. And it has to be done more times, probably because of that and because you don't have the scaffolding in there. So the way I'm doing it, it's a little more aggressive for the patients. I mean, they don't go back to work right after I finish it. They, they, they have to go home, their head's bloody and they have to go home. And, um, but they only have to do it once or twice to establish a response and then once a year after that. So, uh, there are many different ways to do PRP, but one of the things I've heard as a frustration on the part of patients is 
that some doctors are doing it six, seven, 10 times, and then they say, well, it's not working for you. That's a hard pill for them to swallow. You know, if I do it once or twice and it doesn't work, well, okay, I told them upfront, I'm gonna do it once or twice. If at the end, three months after the second time, we don't see a response that's visible on side-by-side -side photos, it doesn't work for you. It's not worth you continuing. Yes, I on first consultation, I tell them, I'm not 100% sure it will work for you or not. As it's variable, it has a lot of variables, so it can work for you, but if at any point you feel unsatisfied, for example, I ask him or her three to six session, but I ask on first after one sitting, do you feel any difference? The first response is always patients say, yes, I feel when I push, put my hand in my hair, I feel that they are, their diameter is improved, their feel is good. So by this gesture of the patient, you come to know that patient is feeling better. If after one to two sitting, patient says, I have no effect, I, my response or my replies immediately, you should stop this treatment because I think it's not gonna work for you. Yeah. So this is how I- Okay, okay, I think that's fair. I, I just think it's really important. Okay. I'll get to you in a minute, uh, Dr. Khalid. Um, I think- yeah, I'm Dr. Khalid, I want to ask, is there any study that, uh, how much level of platelets should be in the blood of patient to have a good result because some patients having some viral infection, some liver diseases, they have very low level of platelets. So if we do PRP in that patients, so there may be the cause of a, a low profile of results. Yeah, well, I, I sunk a lot of money into a study trying to find the answer to that, and I didn't find the answer. So I don't know what the answer is. I don't think anybody- and My second point is that uh, nowadays, the girls are very slimmy, 45, 46 kg. So if you draw 100 to 200 ml blood, would you put, no. put some extra fluid, IV fluids to- no, 100 to 120 mLs, not 200 mLs. Um, I draw 100 to 120 mLs, and uh, my patients actually get an IV. Ah, okay. So, okay. Yeah. So I mean, if we I, have to always, with 100 mL, IV should be there, and one 500 mL ringer should be on. Yeah, I mean, I, I give an IV to all of my patients because we're tapping the vein anyhow. So I just put the IV in with it. Yeah. Okay. This is a new and good uh, practical point for us. Yeah, sure. Thank yes. you. Yes, I, I, do, I, I do appreciate this point that we should be drawing uh, more, more blood, like uh, 100 ml or 120 ml. Uh, at one time and waiting for uh, at least 90 days to see the results. If uh, well, my idea is I, I do give uh, uh, PRPs like at an interval of uh, 90 days, uh, uh, after 90 days. But uh, to me, uh, more important is uh, 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 to put it like on certain depth at the level of dermal papilla, I, I would say. That because uh, the concept uh, is dermal papilla is having some growth factor receptors. So if we put PRP at that level, it would be more effective like than putting like in mid in midway or like uh, at any other level. So well, I uh, think we should be, on yes. on the injection point. There's there's two things that I've actually found. Number one is that some of my patients have really atrophic skin. I mean, you can't, you almost can't inject in the more superficial regions. It's, it's thin and tight. And yes. if you do inject in those regions, you actually create a vasoconstriction that's quite significant. And I think can cause increased hair shedding. 
So in those patients, I don't worry about injecting deeper. I mean, it dissipates. It's not like it stays just where we put it. It's not a transplant. It's PRP, the factors move. I'm not so worried. What I'm actually more worried about is that it's evenly distributed throughout the area we're treating and that um, I haven't created too much of a pressure in the superficial plane that I actually create vasoconstriction. Um, so yeah, um, and I really think I, one of the big takeaways, I, I mean, I'm always really excited about the regenerative stuff and yet I'm also always holding back with my patients because I don't want them to think that I'm suggesting this treatment just because this is the one I make money off of. And that's actually how I phrase it to them. And I say, look, minoxidil, if you're a great responder, you'll do just as well as you would do with PRP or exosomes. Well, exosomes, I don't know. We might even do better with exosomes, but I don't know yet. Uh, same thing with the DHT blockers. Those are less expensive, they're non-invasive, and you don't need to come in to me on a regular interval to get it done. So I'm not selling you these regenerative procedures because they are better necessarily. You don't have to do something every day and you don't need to take a drug. Um, so that is the main thing that I emphasize with my patients. And I think it also makes them really trust what I'm saying. And many of them will, even though they called me because they read I'm the PRP person, they will try the minoxidil. You know what? Actually, after talking to you, I think I will try the minoxidil for nine months. And I'm like, well, I'm glad to hear that. That's what you should do. Yes, right? this is the point, actually. We should be starting with, if we are uh, uh, treating physicians of hair fall, we should be like uh, synchronizing everything, like finasteride, minoxidil, then PRP, then anything else. So uh, what I say to my patients is, if you you are on only on PRP, then uh, you are missing something. Like you should be going for, where is DHT blocker? Why don't you use uh, minox minoxidil? So I, I advise to every patient, starting from like uh, uh, in early 20s and going to 60s, I would recommend them periodic treatment of uh, DHT blockers and uh, minoxidil and PRP. So we, we should be uh, having combo treatments of DHT blockers, minoxidil and PRP. So that's another point that I think is really important to be honest with yourself and your patients about. So, I mean, sometimes I see these amazing results of a hair transplant, but really that doctor put the patient on dutasteride at the exact same time. And so the result is actually the combination of dutasteride and the hair transplant. Sometimes they're doing PRP and they start them on minoxidil at the same time. Which one does what? And I'm not saying it's wrong to do that, but what I always tell my patients is, if you're okay doing three things for your hair loss, and you don't care which one is successful as long as you have a higher chance of having success using three rather than using one, then fine, we'll start you with three. But if we start you with three, you won't know which one of those three really is working for you. It, you know, or whether they're all working for you. And as somebody who myself, I suffered with hair loss since I was young, if I could do one thing to help my hair loss rather than three, I would way rather do one thing. So that's what I do with my patients. I start them with one thing, we assess. Does it work, does it not work? It doesn't work, let's stop it. Let's start item number two. Now, if it does work, but it doesn't work as well as you would like. Okay, we add item number two. But I don't throw a lot. Now, it's not necessarily the, the right way or the only way to go, but that's my explanation for the patients. And I have had some patients that say to me, I don't care. I'll do five things for my hair as long as a year from now my hair is going to, I have a higher chance that my hair will look better. I say, okay, you understand. You won't know which one of the five is working or not working. That is that is that is best approach. Uh, uh, if if we are 
uh, professionals, what, what I want to suggest everybody, we should be like uh, squeezing prescription actually. But uh, I agree with your point. You, you, we can start with one thing, uh, test it down, and uh, start with another thing, or like uh, uh, test it down, and then the uh, uh, three things. But uh, when we are treating like patients at uh, coming at age of uh, 20, 21, uh, like in early 20s or early 30s with uh, like uh, aggressive miniaturization and uh, going on male pattern baldness and then we 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 uh, we, we are more conscious about giving finasteride minoxidil as like uh, we have to block the dht we have to give minoxidil and then prp mm, yeah i agree all right well i think we reached our time anyhow right yes Thank nice you. Thank to see you everyone. Much. Thank you very much. And uh, 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 we, we always uh, uh, appreciate your efforts towards the hair restoration uh, surgery. And uh, we are looking forward uh, uh, to see you again in uh, Hair Restoration Society of Pakistan. We are seriously thankful to you. And we will be like uh, Dr. Varis Anwar is General Secretary of uh, Hair Restoration Society, and uh, he will be like sending you uh, some certificates of this. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Robin, thank you so much for joining us and uh, on this prestigious forum of uh, HRSP. And uh, I would, I will, would say, please say my best regards to your father. I Dr. will. Yes. You know. When I was a very young surgeon, first time I attended ISHRS in 2004, I got a textbook of hair transplant surgery, which was given to me by my uh, trainer. I got my tra hair transplant training from Dr. Bernard Cohen, who, ah, yeah. Yeah, who invented that hair check. I yeah. visited him. I was a fellow in the University of Miami, Florida. So he was professor emeritus there. Yeah. I got training from him and he gave me that book as a gift. And he introduced to me to ISHRS and I got membership in 2003. And 2004, I met first time to your dad. I had, uh, I know him by his book. So I went to him, I just asked, I am a very new to this field. I would like an advice from you. And you said what he said. He said, look, just put your hair down and do a good work. One day you will get everything, skill, fame, and everything. And it, those were so kind words. And those words proved so much good for me. And I started working hard in hair transplant. And finally, I ended up with highest aggregate of ABHRS. Uh, to I topped the 2019 exam and all credit goes to your and your dad's book. I really like that book. It is very comprehensive and everything is there. And I recommend to everyone, whoever is listening to me and is going to appear in ABHRS exam, that that book is just like a Bible. You have everything. You got everything. Yeah. Yes. But, but you know, Robin, he has uh, uh, like, uh, uh, he was top in uh, oral and written examination. Uh -huh. ABHRS 9, uh, 2019. Uh, he, he is a, a gorgeous person and uh, leading like uh, in one busy town of Lahore in Pakistan. Ah, in Lahore. Yeah. It, Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much, Robin. All thank right, you thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Allah Allah Thank you very much.